So uh, for thousands of years, uh, humanity has developed a couple of uh, cultural practices and uh, we've got acquainted to them quite well and we do understand them quite well. If you think about telecommunications, for an example, um, take telecommunications, um, so roughly two millennia before Christ, the Egyptians started writing letters. And of course, in the beginning, uh, they were a little bit awkward and they started uh, writing papyri. And um, if you think about today, then uh, all of us can send letters, right? Uh, so you can send a letter and, uh, and uh, you can post it today and you can send it anywhere around the world to any recipient. And uh, it, it works rather quickly and uh, it's actually even uh, very much affordable. So we have a democratization of uh, communication here. Or a second example, if we think about information dissemination and acquisition, if we uh, think about structured or systematized um, information acquisition, and dissemination, this probably starts with the Gutenberg Bible, so the printing press of, of Gutenberg. And um, now let's think a, bit about, a little bit about um, information sovereignty. Of course, in, in the beginning, it was mainly the church who could control what would have been printed and uh, what was disseminated. But then later on, of course, there have been other uh, means of uh, disseminating information, um, be it newspapers, so more and more uh, venues popped up where people could actually publish something, or even television uh, that everybody could actually access um, without any problem at home. Now, if we think, think about these uh, traits here, then um, we see, uh, with respect to access, we, th we see two properties. One property is the type of access, and the second is the scope. What do I, do I mean by that? Um, so when we think about the, the type of access, this access is uh, usually anonymous. So what you're, what you're actually doing uh, in the old days was uh, you were going to your news agent, and you would uh, actually pay with anonymous money, and, uh, and your news agent maybe knew your face, so he would already know, ah, oh, this guy is reading this newspaper, and he would already uh, serve it to you. But essentially, there was no identification of the people involved who would actually uh, trade this information. And the second thing is scope. So uh, some of us um, still have uh, photo albums at home. And, um, and in the case of photo albums, of course, the scope is, uh, is obviously quite local. So usually you have a photo album stacked in your closet at home in the living room. And uh, the photo album is brought out exactly when you come home with your new girlfriend or boyfriend and your mum wants to embarrass you, right? Um, <laughs> But you see, it's a local access and um, it's rather um, protected in a way. Now, of course, uh, what we see now is that uh, everything is changing and um, the services uh, are, are changing quite drastically. If you think about payment, for example, now payment is digitized, so you can actually pay with your phone wherever you go. Or when you think about sending letters or mails, you can send emails now. And um, this goes on an instant, right? You can send an email and maybe some of us wish that people could not send so many emails. But in any case, so um, you can send, send emails for free and uh, they go, go all around the world. Also, when you think about television, now most of us have uh, IPTV, so um, you actually get your television over the internet. Hundreds of channels, uh, you can even look at, uh, at the same soccer match from different angles and so on, and, uh, and of course, it's, because it's a, an, an amazing thing. And we all don't need uh, photo albums anymore because we have social media, right? Now, when we think about all these services, I'm a big supporter of these services. I like technology, and I don't want to say that anything is bad. It's just that we have to keep a few things in mind. So um, when you think back to the two types of, um, or the two uh, aspects of access, when you think about the, the scope and the type of access, then this has changed a bit. And the reason is that, of course, uh, now you have this international and global infrastructure, which is the internet, right? And your device at home is connected to this infrastructure. So you go home, um, you go to your device, and your device actually establishes the connection to a server. And uh, the server is the server of Google and Facebook, and uh, you name them. And then, of course, you get the service. And it's not only your device at home, it's also your mobile phone that you carry around all the time. Um, or even your uh, television now is connecting over the internet to these servers, and it's receiving all this information. It's asking for certain channels, and then it's actually receiving this information. And the really cool thing is that um, the service providers that we have here, they don't only provide web search or, um, or streaming of video, but they also provide other same things. So Google, for instance, provides you with this great, uh, all these great telephones and uh, Google Mail. And um, for some times, we thought there would be Google Glasses and uh, Google Plus, the social network, and so on. So that's really great because they can get a better picture of you and understand you better, so they can provide you better services, of course. Or the same thing for Apple, if you think um, uh, of other uh, contestants in this case, you, of course, have the iWatch and the Apple Watch and the iTV and, um, and the iCloud and so on. So these service providers get to know you much better, and, uh, of course, they can provide better services. Now, thinking about the two, these two aspects, um, the, uh, the type of access and the scope, then, of course, we see that um, now we have centralized service providers and um, we have global access over the Internet. Wherever you are, you can access this information. I'm a computer scientist, so I like to break up things into smaller things that, that I can understand. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an impression how these systems work, let's, let's take social media for an example. So, of course, in the case of social media and Facebook, uh, you can... Uh, 
you can communicate, you can send seemingly private messages to your friends, or you can publish information and they can comment and so on. And this, of course, all happens on this kind of application layer. This application is provided by a service. We just saw that, that um, you have a device that is connected to the internet, and then uh, it, uh, it actually accesses the service on a server. And then finally, of course, this, act, uh, this connectivity over the internet works in the way that your device is connecting to routers, and then there are networks, and, and all this information is distributed over the network. Now, um, we have global access because, of course, anybody can connect to the, uh, to the service provider. We have a centralized service provi provider that will store all of your information, all of your seemingly private messages in one centralized um, uh, data store. And then we have the communication over the internet, which usually is unencrypted because uh, encrypting stuff uh, takes uh, energy and time. So, so usually you send all this information in an unencrypted fashion. And, uh, and now you noticed maybe that I wrote that there's perfect observability because of um, what, what changed, of course, in, uh, in uh, comparison to the old services or to, the, to our old ways of doing, doing things is that now we are perfectly observable. Um, of course, if you think about um, parties that you probably do not want to share this information with, they have uh, great access to this data. Right? So, for example, um, when you think that you're communicating over the Internet, your telecom provider can access all of this information. Um, and uh, the telecom providers actually have run great studies on uh, social media behavior because they could see what the people were actually writing and sending. Um, also, of course, the other telecom providers and the, the other internet service providers all the way on the way to the uh, service provider can see all this information. The service providers themselves, of course, I mean, they need the data, right? They want to get to know you better, so, um, so they need all this information. So there, of course, is also access. And um, now there's one thing that most of these service providers are located in the United States, and um, the United States no knows this legal um, artifact that is called the National Security Letters. So as a matter of fact, all of your information is not only accessible to the service provider, but also the American government. And you shouldn't know about that. Okay, but, um, but then uh, let's say that there are even other people um, even if uh, you would think about some adversaries that uh, do not really um, have any access on these lower layers, there can be social media analytics because, of course, we have global access. Anybody can look at your Facebook or Google prof profile from anywhere in the world, and they can, of course, get all the information that you're posting there. Now, um, if we think about uh, these, uh, the situation here, most of the people usually say, yeah, but I mean, there's not so much information that I'm, sh that I'm sharing. So I just want to give you a rough intu intuition of what you're actually sharing. So I think of Bob here. Bob has created this um, Facebook or Google Plus profile. And um, Bob, of course, is sharing explicitly content. Um, for example, he's creating content because he's creating a profile. Um, he's writing comments on other people's profiles and their posts. And of course, there's also structural inter uh, interaction because uh, Bob is adding friends to his friend list and he's probably liking things. And this, of course, is obvious. I mean, Bob knows that he's sharing this information and, uh, and it's clear and uh, nobody could say that I didn't know. So, uh, of course, that's obvious. However, there's some, uh, some other information that Bob is also sharing, and um, one of these other information types is metadata. You may have heard of metadata. It's only metadata. And um, in metadata, there's actually quite a lot that you're sharing that you may not even be aware. Um, so don't read all this, but uh, there are session artifacts. Um, the service provider can know when you go online, for which amount of time you go online. There's interest because the, uh, the service provider, of course, knows what uh, profiles you're retrieving. He knows what uh, groups or uh, member memberships and groups you have. Uh, he knows in which discussions you're participating. He can measure your influence because uh, it's quite easy to measure influence just by judging at uh, how many people are actually interacting with the, the content that you're sharing. Of course, you can also see the click stream, uh, see the click streams and ad preferences because they know on which ad you're actually clicking. Um, he can observe your entire communication. So, and that is, that's not only the communication itself. That let's assume that um, he doesn't know what you're writing, but he know uh, he knows uh, the endpoints of the communication. So, who's talking to whom, the type of communication, the intensity of communication, the frequency of communication, the extent, and all this. And then finally, finally, of course, there's location. Some of us share photos and some of us uh, embed the GPS location in the photos and then of course it's clear to see where this photo has been shot and potentially also where this person has been. Uh, but even uh, if you don't share the GPS uh, location in your photos, there's the IP address that you use on the internet which discloses quite nicely where you are on the planet. But there's more. So, um, of course, once I have all this information, I can also infer certain things. And, uh, for example, we can uh, build preference models or we can create image recognition models. That works really quite nicely in Facebook, for example, because people actually even tag photos and the, the pictures, the faces of people in the pictures, with a clear name of people. So it's really great, a uh, really great resource to actually uh, create image recognition models. And finally, now, now you may think, yeah, but it's probably only in Facebook or in, in Google that, is, uh, that um, somebody can observe what I'm doing. But as a matter of fact, there's also external correlation. So when after logging out of Google, you go to CNN or BBC, then of course, um, Google or Facebook are still, still do have their ad networks. 
And they still know which articles you're reading, um, correlated with your clear name. Now you still may say this is probably not so much of a problem. Um, quite nicely, though, um, there has been a paper that has been published uh, a rough uh, three years ago, which I would encourage you to read. It's only four pages. It's very easy to understand, where some researchers were taking only the likes of your profiles. And um, only by analyzing the likes of the profiles, um, they have been building these kind of inference models, and they were able to predict your age, your gender, your, uh, your political preferences, your sexual preferences, your intelligence, and uh, all sorts of other stuff with very high accuracy, just by looking at your likes. And I'm pretty sure that most of you don't hide your likes. But anyways, now Bob could, of course, say, well, pff, but I, I haven't really got anything to hide, right? So this is usually the comment um, that we always hear. And I wish to agree on two levels with it. Uh, I wish to disagree on two levels with it. Um, because first of all, I believe that we all can agree that there are certain individuals or groups who legitimately have something to hide. If you think about minorities, minorities of race, of, of political uh, um, opinion, or of uh, probably uh, religion, then I guess that we can all agree that they should be able to hide something, right? Because um, they need to be able to form their opinions and uh, they need to be able to communicate. And um, now if uh, these uh, people are the only people who start hiding something, then hiding something becomes a really very great signal. So um, if, as soon as I see somebody hide something, then I go poke uh, a little bit closer because obviously this person has something to hide. So I believe that we should all, even though we don't think that we have something to hide, we should hide just in order to give these people the possibility to hide in some noise. And there's a second thing, which is, um, what is it that you have to hide? Or what, what exactly do you think is something to hide? Just take the situation in Turkey at the moment. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, 10 years ago, the, the supporters of Fethullah Gülen, um, they were not believing that they had anything to hide. Au contraire, they were very proud that they were the supporters. And they were bringing Erdogan to become president, right? So they were, they were of course, there was nothing to hide uh, regarding their support. But now, 10 years down the road, maybe they think differently because uh, thousands of them have been incarcerated just based on the fact that they are supporters. So, um, so the, the winds can change quite quickly, as a matter of fact. And uh, maybe you, you still think Turkey is far away, so I would like to do a very little experiment. So uh, who of you has a Facebook account? OK, that's pretty much everybody. Who of you thinks that they know exactly how the Facebook privacy settings work? OK, but that was a funny one, right? So let's switch gears a bit. Um, who of you has been serving in the army? OK, so I see that uh, now, now suddenly the reaction is a little bit slower. And the, the reason being is that suddenly you start to contextualize um, the question. And you, you start to try to figure out if you should share this information or not with the audience that you have here. And um, now just imagine uh, what would happen if I would ask if, uh, if uh, I don't know, for example, you like the current uh, refugee politics of Angela Merkel, or if you really believe that um, Hillary Clinton is the best president um, for the next, uh, in the next phase for the United States. Suddenly you start to try to figure out, is this really information that I want to share with this audience? And this is something that um, other scientists have actually studied um, in quite um, a lot of detail. And um, there are plenty of studies that show that people who have the feeling that they are under observation, who have the feeling that they are, that they, um, are surveilled at, uh, at a certain moment in time, they change their behavior. And um, they change their behavior in such a way that they act in the way that they believe that they're ex expected to be, uh, behave. And, um, and this, of course, is frightening, right? Because uh, without your personal weirdnesses, there is no innovation. And of course, there cannot be any democracy. So I believe that, that uh, there's definitely something to hide. And, um, and of course, we need to be able uh, to communicate freely without um, dragnet surveillance. But in any case, so what can we do? I don't want to only, only want to frighten you, but I want to show you that you actually can do something. Um, starting with this model again uh, that I showed you before, maybe starting with a, the with a top layer, um, when you think about social media analytics, um, something that e-marketing companies but also government agencies are actually doing, what can you do to hide your information here? As a matter of fact, this is not so difficult to do because this is what the uh, an act that the service provider actually is trying to help you with. And if you still think, um, I think most of you didn't believe that you know how the privacy controls work, my group has been building a tool that you can download for Firefox or Chrome that you can install in Firefox or Chrome. And it's actually going to show you your profile in Facebook in a colored fashion such that the color actually shows you who can actually see certain content. And you can also click on, right click on certain attributes and you can directly change the settings. So that's much, much easier than, uh, than what you have today, of course. So maybe um, with the, um, authorizing act actively, you can already somehow get uh, some security on this layer. Thinking about the communication layer, what can you do on the communication layer? Of course, I would uh, encourage you to, co to communicate confidentially. So, um, for example, 
um, the fine people of the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, have also provided a plugin that you can easily install in your Firefox or Chrome, which is called HTTPS Everywhere. And what it does it, it is it is essentially um, always tries to connect to a secure version of a web page, if there is one. And uh, so you don't really have to think about this anymore. Your traffic is going to be encrypted in any case. So that's already great because then it's uh, more difficult to figure out what kind of content you're exchanging. If you want to go one step uh, further, of course, you can try to hide as well. So um, your, as I said, your IP address gives away a lot of information about you. And you can use services like Tor or uh, Anon, which, uh, which has been uh, developed partially here at uh, TU Dresden, um, in order to hide where you are and with whom you're actually communicating. So that would be a th uh, another thing to do in order to secure communication on the, on the networking layer here. However, then of course uh, we, we end up at this uh, middle step here, so the service provision, right? So at the moment um, there still is uh, this adversary which is the service provider themselves and potentially other uh, agencies that get access to this data. And there of course it gets a little bit complicated. What, what can you do in order to protect your information in this case? And uh, what my group thinks is, uh, thinks is that um, you shouldn't put all your eggs into the same basket. What do I mean by that? So at the moment what we see is um, that uh, you have centralized providers, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, and these centralized uh, providers store and keep all of your data in an unencrypted fashion. That, of course, uh, means that as soon as the centralized provider is compromised by any way, all the information is lost, so uh, everybody, or the, the, the data of everybody is actually um, is, uh, given away and lost. So what we were thinking is, and not only us, but um, several colleagues as well, is uh, why don't we go back to the systems, uh, how email, for example, worked. Why don't we simply decentralize the services again, such that you can choose your provider of choice, the, the one that you're trusting, and then uh, these service providers can uh, communicate be between each other, and hence, um, at least there's not one single point of potential breach. And actually, um, if you think about communication, for example, I saw that many people are using, using WhatsApp um, here uh, earlier. If you think about communication like chat messages, there is a very basic service that works beautifully. It's called Jabber, and uh, you can download it for your mobile phone, you can download it for your, uh, for your end device, for your laptop, and so on. And you can get rid of, uh, of WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or Google Hangouts and so on because it works beautifully. It, uh, it, uh, there's, no, there's no lost um, usability or anything. And suddenly the, you have end-to-end -end encryption such that uh, the content that you're exchanging is, uh, is uh, secure and private. And also you use the distributed service, so, so nobody can actually look at with whom you're communicating at what time. But also when you think about social networks, so some of you may have heard of Diaspora or Safebook or Pearson, there are decentralized services which are available and, um, and you can use them instead of using Facebook, Twitter and Google Plus and so on, and uh, which work exactly in the way that, um, that they're, they're trying to decentralize and hence um, getting rid of this uh, single centralized provider. Now what we think at my group is um, that we should probably even go one step further. So we, we would like to, to go dark. And what do I mean by that? So we're working on friend-to-friend -friend networks at the moment. And the idea is that um, even in the, in the scenario that I was describing you a minute ago, you still have a service provider that you need to trust, right? And we think you shouldn't have any service provider that you trust, but um, you should ha simply have the people that you trust yourselves. So what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to use your social network, or you should use your social network that you have in reality. So the devices of people will only connect to devices of other people when the owners of the devices have a friendship link in, in real life. And by that, your device will only actually connect or get the service from a device of one of your friends. And what we achieve by that is that we have um, entire freedom from observation. So nobody, can, nobody you don't trust can actually figure out what you're doing at that moment in time or what kind of content you're um, retrieving and so on. And as a matter of fact, if you get, get unobservability, of course, you get uh, much more um, resilience towards censorship as well. Now, we're still uh, working on the uh, resilience against sabotage, but we'll, we're going to get there. So I would invite you to, um, if, you're, if you think that is interesting and this could be a way to go, I would like you to have a look at the website of the freenetproject.org. We are not affiliated to the Freenet Project, but um, we like to support them because they're going in the right direction. Or if you want to have more information, you can also look at our website, of course, of, of my chair, because we are actively, actively working in this direction. And uh, that being said, I would uh, say um, that we should really uh, not give up on diversity and privacy on the web just yet. Thank you very much.